Hi there, welcome to Board Gems. This is my regular video series in which I cover an older board game that I think is a gem. I'm often wrong, I'm usually wrong, but I think they're gems and this is my video channel. Now, if you're familiar with my video channel though, you're gonna see the back is a little bit different. Usually when I record these videos, I do it in front of my main wall of games, which is on this side, but I recently installed new shelves on this wall, so I'm just kind of fooling around, giving you something else to look at. The board gem I want to talk about today is Ponte del Diavolo. Now this is from designer Martin Abel and was published by Hansem Gluck in, I think, 2007. It is for two players only. And in fact, this is a two player perfect information abstract. So like chess or go or shogi or xiang chi or checkers or reverse slash Othello. Not usually my cup of tea and not usually Hans and Gluck's cup of tea. As far as I know, they have not published any other two player perfect information abstract game. They have published some two player and you could argue are abstract games like fjords. Um, they've also done perfect information abstract games like uh, Medina and Yucata by designer Stefan Dora. They're perfect information, but because they're multiplayer, more chaos comes in from the different players. When you have a two-player perfect information abstract, of course, there's basically no chaos, right? It's just all, you know, brain versus brain. I was very curious about this game because it's not typical Hans and Gluck fair. Is there anything special about this game that made them want to publish it? Well, I do know that for one thing, this game is a, uh, it's an homage, actually. And you're not gonna be able to see very well, but uh, this illustration here, of course, this is supposed to be Venice. And that is, in fact, the Ponte del Diavolo, the, the Devil's Bridge. And so right there on the Devil's Bridge itself is an illustration of Alex Randolph, very famous game designer from long, long time ago. And he lived most of his adult life in Venice. And this game from Martin Abel is basically an homage to him. And it features some feet, at least one strong feature that is very reminiscent of an Alex Randolph game. Anyway, why don't I show you how it plays? Then I'll talk about why it's a gem. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. The board is quite small, so we probably want to play on a small table if possible. The more experienced player goes first. You start with what's called the pie rule. The start player is going to make the first move with light, and they're going to place as their first move two of these blocks somewhere on the board. Afterwards, the other player may choose which color to play as. So if they choose dark, then they would immediately start their turn as dark. And if they choose light, then that's their turn. And then the start player will go again, but playing as dark. This is to offset the advantage of the start player going first. Now the goal of the game is to create islands of size four. For example, like this, it can be any shape as long as it's four blocks large and there are no blocks of the same color adjacent to it, even diagonally. That is a completed island. Each completed island by itself is worth one point, but for every one that you can connect via bridges is worth extra points. Bridges go across water connecting two pieces exactly two spaces away. You can place them diagonally, at which point this water space has to be empty. You could place it just across from each, from each other, but in which case this water space would have to be empty. Or you could even do this kind of at an angle, at which point both of these two spaces must be water. The other player's blocks can be next to the islands. That's completely fine. If this block is here, light can no longer place a bridge there or there. 
because the water spaces have to be empty. The only valid place for bridge connecting these two islands would be here because this water space is empty. Each island alone is worth one point, but every successive island that's connected via bridges is worth an extra point. So this is worth one and this is worth one, but this total is worth three. One for the first one, two for the second, three for the third, and so on. They don't have to be connected in a line just as long as they're all connected so they can branch you're just counting the number of islands that are all connected to each other. Islands cannot have any pieces of the same color in any space around it, including diagonal. And this means two things. For one thing, the light player can now not place a piece anywhere around this island, but it can also mean if it looks something like this, the light player can never complete this island because that would also break the rule of having no light colors adjacent to it. So it's an easy thing to forget kind of while you're playing, and it's good for the experienced player to point out, okay, like, hey, just so you know, this, is, this will never be an island now, right, because of this. So on your turn, you have two choices. You can either place two blocks of your own color, or you can place a bridge. If you place two blocks of your color, it would be just like this, just like the start move. Dark would go next, and Dark can place their two blocks, and they could put them together or completely far apart. <laughs> it's completely up to them. Instead of placing two blocks, you can place a bridge. The goal eventually is to connect as many islands of yours as you can with bridges. But you don't have to wait until you build the islands before you can build bridges. You could build a bridge now. Notably, each tile can only support one bridge. So if it looks something like this and Dark put a bridge there, they could not build a bridge from this space to here. They would have to try to extend the island somehow if they wanted to, and then they could connect like so. So on your turn, you place two blocks of your own color, or you place one bridge connecting two blocks of your color. And those two blocks must be two spaces away with only water in between them. And once a bridge is built, no player can place any blocks under the bridge. The game continues until one player cannot place two blocks on their turn. They could still play a bridge, but if they choose not to play a bridge, so they're unable to play two blocks, and although they have the option of placing a bridge, they choose not to, that triggers the end of the game. If light triggers the end of the game, then dark will get one more turn. If dark triggers the end of the game, the game is over. And then you score all the islands. I'll fast forward to a completed game so you can see how scoring works. Okay, so I finished a sample game of Ponte del Diavolo. What happened is that the light player actually ran out of tiles. You can see there's no more light tiles in the box. And so on their turn, they could have continued and built a bridge, but they chose not to build a bridge. That gave the dark player one more turn. Dark player played, and now the game is over. And now we score. To score, you count chains of completed islands connected by bridges. So if we look at the light player, light has four islands. Remember, we only look at the islands of size four. Those are completed islands. One, two, three, four. These are all connected. That total for points will be 10. Another two connected here. That's another three for 13. And two islands off by themselves, not connected to any others, because this is not a complete island. They're each worth one. So Light's final score is 15. And now we look at Dark. Dark has a chain of three islands here. That's worth six points. Dark has another chain of three islands here. That's also worth six points. We're at 12 so far. And two islands connected here, three. And the grand total, the score for Dark is 15. So unless I did my math wrong, which is very, very possible, this is a tie. So the first tiebreaker is the player who 
build to the most islands. So if we look at, again, we're looking at completed islands of size four. So we look at light, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and now dark, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Still a tie. Now we go to the second tiebreaker, which is number of bridges. This is actually unusual to go into uh, this deep into the tiebreakers. But the second tiebreaker is number of bridges. So let's look at lights, bridges, one, two, three, four, five. And now we look at dark, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So dark won on the second tiebreaker. If it was still tied at that point, then it would be a draw. That's it. You're ready to play Ponte del Diavolo. I find the two-player perfect information abstract genre to be a fascinating one and one that for the most part isn't really for me. But it's not usually what I'm looking for in a game. Um, I do like to think, but I like there to be a little bit more chaos and fun. So, but you know, I experiment, right? So I've tried a few. I tried a few of the GIF series, uh, my favorite being Devon, and I've played Ponte del Diavolo and a few others. The thing about that genre is that peep, it's, they're deep dives, right? It feels weird to me to taste two-player abstract games. Not that there's anything wrong with it. There's, there's lots of two-player abstract games out there. And if you love that genre, of course, you're going to want to, to try a whole bunch of different ones, find, find the best for you. They really reward diving deep into the game. You know, playing preferably against the same opponent, but not necessarily, but playing again and again and seeing the game at a deeper and deeper level. And you can do that with these games, and you could argue it's the most rewarding uh, playing that way. But because of that, I don't feel like there's a lot of room in people's mind share for many different types of two-player abstract games. You have Western Chess, Shogi, Xiang Chi. You have Go slash Wei Chi. Um, of course, you have classics that are a little bit lighter and easier to get into, like Checkers and Reversi. And of course, you can add uh, Mancala and a whole bunch of others uh, to that list. Uh, Nine Men's Morris and, and so many. They're more rewarding the more you play them. So when you have a game like Western Chess, for example, that gets huge amounts of attention and huge amounts of uh, play. So many people learn the game. So many people play the game. I mean, chess almost can become a lifestyle. And so it's hard for a different game to come in. Like if you were to say, hey, you know, you love chess here, try this game. A lot of chess players are going to be resistant to that because they love chess. So do they need a new game in their life? Maybe not. So a game like that from a company like Hans M. Gluck, that's got my attention. It's They're obviously aiming it toward the hobby, but, but also a potential there for mass market because Carcassonne became mass market. That's in the same kind of box uh, shape, box format. And so it's, it's light and it's kind of easy to get into, but it is a two player perfect information abstract, which means it's as deep and thinky as you want it to be. Uh, so, but they, they don't do this type of game. So what makes this game special? Please keep in mind, I don't play a lot of two player perfect information abstracts. It's possible that this game isn't very popular among fans of that genre. I don't know. I can only judge it based on its own merits that it presents to me as a hobby gamer who likes thinky games, but also likes light games. And this actually threads the needle really, really well. Chess is great, but there's one thing that bugs me about it, and that is it severely punishes a single move mistake, right? And that's because chess is a very dynamic game, right? Bishops, rooks, queens, they can go very far across the, across the board. And if you're not paying attention and you do something wrong, it's like, oh, you lost a rook, right? And especially like when you're playing against an AI, it can feel like you're, the battle is just not to make mistakes. <laughs> if you don't make mistakes, maybe you have a slim chance. <laughs> 
but any mistake is going to be capitalized on. And so it feels sometimes like a very negative experience. But there's a reward to these uh, sort of big dynamic plays that are possible in games like chess and also checkers and uh, and reversi. Like you, sometimes you can do like a big play, right? I will say Ponte del Diavolo isn't really like that. There isn't a case where on a player's turn they're going to put down a piece and then it's like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. It's not really that kind of game. But it does make the game feel a little bit more approachable and feel less punishing. On your turn, you're going to put down two tiles or a bridge. And that's it. You don't have to put the tiles together, right? You can put one tile here or one tile there. And one thing that's kind of neat to do is putting tiles in two different places that forces your opponent to choose which one to block if they have to block with a bridge. Of course, they can block with tiles. They'll do that. They can place two tiles too and can block you. But if they have to block with a bridge just because of the way the tiles are laid out, then by picking one, they're giving you the other uh, as an opportunity. If you let your opponent divide the board up in half for you, not for them, but for you, it's going to be very hard for you to win because you're not able to connect many islands together. You're limited to one half and the other half. And all these things, so you're playing short term and long term, and that's what you want in a two player perfect information abstract. You need to think on multiple levels. Well, my opponent has an opportunity here, which I could block, but maybe it's more important that I make sure to try to make sure that they can't get around me to build, connect islands up in this quarter of the board. So you have these multiple levels of thinking and you have to prioritize. And that's really great. I love that. But it's not like chess, right? Where suddenly a bishop seems to come out of nowhere and now you're forked or pinned. And it's, it's not that, that kind of game. But it also makes it a bit of a less aggressive game. Not everybody's going to like a game in which you're attacking each other, right? And that's very often a normal part of a two-player abstract game because it's zero-sum. Me attacking you benefits me in equal measure. But if you think you may not like, or your the opponent you think you might be playing with, wouldn't really like that so much, that, uh, that aggressiveness, and it's more about board positioning, um, this is a great choice. The game is presented as an homage to Alex Randolph. One way that manifests is that at the start, there's the pie rule, also known as the swap rule. The idea is, is that, you know, in chess, one player is white and one player is black, and white always goes first, and white thus has an advantage. One way in this game that counteracts the start player advantage, because in this game, light still goes first, but, and this is borrowed from Twixt, which is a game designed by Alex Randolph, in that you have two colors. You have a start color. In, this, in Ponte del Diavolo's case, it's light, and you have the, the, the color that goes second, which is dark. One player is a start player, and in the rules, I think, is the most experienced player. They go first, and they start with placing two tiles somewhere on the board. But the other player then chooses which color they want to play as. So if the start player places the two light colored tiles, let's say in the center, close to the center, then the other player will go, oh, I'll, I'll be light then. And then they have an advantage. It's, it's often called the pie rule because it's like if you split a pie, the best way to, to ensure that it's cut evenly is to make sure that the player who's not cutting gets to choose which half they want. And that's the case here. So the first player cuts by putting down two light colored tiles and then the other player chooses light or dark. It's a clever, although perhaps not super intuitive, uh, way of counteracting that start player advantage. Uh, you can try it with any two player abstract game that has a start player advantage. You can try it with chess. In that case, you're not going to see e4 very often, right? You'll see slightly different openings, maybe, I don't know, c4 or something, you know, just once in a while, you know, and then the other player decides whether they want to be white or black based on that okay opening, right? Give it a try. It works really well. The island rule that each island has to be four tiles 
large in order to score, but it also can't have any tiles around it, works. And when you start the game, it's like, okay, I realize that, I understand that rule, but while you're playing, very easy to forget it in practice because it works both ways. Once you have a, a four tile island, you can't place any more tiles of that color around it. Okay, great, got that. But that means that let's say you have three tiles and then you have a fourth tile, which is not connected, but it's just at an angle, like a diagonal. That three tile island, I think they call it like a sandbar or something in the rules. It's not an island yet, right? It's a mini island, it's an islet. That can never become an island because once you add a fourth tile, you're gonna break that rule that the four tile islands can't have anything of the same color next to it even diagonally and it's easy to miss uh, if you're playing with a mix like experienced player and inexperienced player the experienced player should probably point out to, just so you know uh, this can never become an island right because of this i mean it's easy once you see it but it's one of those rules that it doesn't really stand out while you're playing and while you're concentrating on strategy it's easy to to not see that that rule is kind of triggered and it's a little bit of a strange end game um, because the game doesn't end until one player can't play any more tiles and chooses not to play a bridge. Then the end game is triggered and you still play. So yeah, I think you have the same number of, like each player has the same number of turns. But that can mean that the game is decided early. But according to the rules, you still have to play it out and fill up the board, even though you know there's no way the other, you know, that player is going to win. The score is already like through the roof for player one. Player two doesn't have a chance. But according to the rules, you have to play it out and fill the board. Of course, it's a two-player abstract game. Any two-player game, you can just resign. And I strongly recommend that in this game. If you fall behind and you're pretty sure that you're not going to be able to catch up, save both you and your opponent the effort and just resign make sure they're okay with it that's proper gaming etiquette right so do you mind if i resign i don't think i'm going to be able to pull a win out of this one and if that player is familiar with the game they'll be like thank you <laughs> one interesting thing is that the game was originally designed as a 12 by 12 game and by the publisher's recommendation as published, it became a 10 by 10 game. Now, 10 by 10 is fine in that the game doesn't take very long. So it's maybe about half an hour, which is which is great. Like that's a nice, easy, thinky filler, basically. I am very curious to try the 12 by 12. I do know that fans of the game have made their own versions, their own homemade versions of Ponte del Diavolo. And when they do that, they usually do 12 by 12. There aren't enough pieces in the box to do a 12 by 12 board with the pieces. You'll need two copies to have enough tiles and bridges, but I will say that copies of this game is very easy to get on the aftermarket. They're, they're not going for a lot of money. The presentation is really, really nice um, in terms of the pieces. So the pieces, it look, they look basically like Scrabble tiles, but without anything printed on them. And there's two different colors, which look like the two different colors I've seen Scrabble tiles, interestingly. Um, they're wood, the bridges are wood. The presentation is very clean and classy, and that's what you want in an abstract game, I feel. But I will say the board is a huge letdown for several reasons. They had some very strange design choices for the board. So they did put, the board is quite small. They did put a border around it, a raised border. So the pieces stay inside the board, but it's very easy for the pieces to slide around. There's a grid, but the grid isn't printed. The grid comes out in that each space is just slightly convex. It's like a very slight hill, each piece. Very strange choice, in my opinion. Um, and the one downside of having the raised border, which you think at least that's good, right? Well, the board doesn't lay flat. Now I'm big on backbending. I'm a backbend a board. I'm really good at it. I almost never damage a board when I backbend and when I'm done, it lays perfectly flat. But the only times that I've had a problem backbending a board, like we're folding it in the reverse direction, just a little bit, right? To try to even it out, flatten it out. The only times I've had a problem doing that 
is when a board has multiple layers. And that's the case with Ponte del Diavolo. The border is like a second board that's kind of glued on, I guess, to the to the main board. It's enough that I don't feel comfortable backbending it because um, I could just break the whole thing in half in twain. So I'm keeping this game. I will probably draw a grid on it just for the ease of play. If you're going to play the game, it's just is a little bit frustrating because it's important you have a tile and you want to have a tile kind of two away diagonally. You can't easily see where that is. So I'll probably draw a grid on mine. I'll get around to it. If this game had a good board, so if it had a recessed spaces where, and the grid was very obvious, which recessed spaces should make the grid obvious, I would think, and maybe 12 by 12, I don't know, but this would be a top tier abstract. Unfortunately, the board does bring the whole experience down a little bit, so it doesn't feel super satisfying to play in practice. Playing online is great, and I love, I play it all the time on Yucata, I think it's great. And of course, you don't have to, the grid is very obvious, and you don't have to worry about the pieces, you know, getting misaligned. But, you know, obviously there's a joy to playing in person, just be aware that the board is a little bit small, and the pieces don't really stay. It is unfortunate, and if it didn't have that problem, I would say this would be a top tier abstract. Keep in mind, I'm not an expert in that genre, but I've, I've played a number of them, and I love Ponte del Diavolo. I think it's one of the better ones. I would love to see this game at its best, with a nice board that keeps the tiles in place, maybe 12 by 12, and I think if that was the case, it would be a top tier two player abstract game, maybe one that people would still be talking about today. Unfortunately, the production had a misstep in places and also the presentation like the box uh, probably didn't help us really stand out in a crowded marketplace. It looks a little bit generic in terms of like the light family German style games, but a different company, maybe one that's more used to doing two player abstracts and could produce this game in a way in which somebody sitting down and playing it one time in their life sees the game at its best, I think this game will get a, a lot more fans than it currently has. It's hard for me to compare this to other two-player abstract games because I don't play a lot of them. Um, but I think in terms of the play, it's comparable to some of the best two-player abstract games out there, including the GIF series. Um, as long as you're okay with, again, a game that's a little bit more gradual, um, that's a, that's a, that can be a plus and a minus, right? The dynamic plays are big and fun and you feel super smart when you do them. And this game doesn't feel like it has a lot of dynamic plays. It's more of a gradual progression to the end. Uh, but at the same time, it also feels more approachable. Uh, it feels less punishing of mistakes, maybe not in practice, but it feels that way. It is a game that I seem to be good at and that probably predisposes me to liking the game. Um, trying to be objective, I do think this is a really good two-player abstract game. At least it's one that I've really, really liked. And if you're interested at all in trying a two-player abstract game, that's something, you know, a little bit off, a little bit more off the beaten track. Uh, there's lots of interesting choices. There are, of course, the GIF games. Those are the ones that are most famous in the hobby. Nestor Games out of Spain put out some amazing abstract games, but unfortunately here in North America, they'd be pretty expensive to get. Um... But this one, if you are if you don't mind a used copy, you can easily find a copy of this game. And in my opinion, it's great. I love Ponte del Diavolo. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Ponte del Diavolo don't stop being good just because newer games come out. Take care.